now. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's Writers Chat. And this is a place where all our buddy writers like to get together and we talk about all things writing for writers and by writers. And we're so happy to see everybody. We got a lot of our regulars in the chat room. Uh, we're waiting for Bethany to join us. She was having some technical difficulties. She'll be here. She's one of our co-hosts. I'm Jean Wise, another one of our co-hosts. And we asked Melissa, who's one of our behind-the-scenes gurus, is always with us to kind of stay on and talk about today. There's Bethany. Hi, Bethany. Yay. She's back and stuff. We just just got started, and we're missing someone today. We're missing Johnny Alexander. She's their other co-host, and uh, she's traveling today, so she won't be with us today. And so, uh, and stuff. Bethany, don't know if you want to talk about your book launch real quick before we get started on metaphors. Do you want to say something about what exciting things happening today? So I just did a photo. I put stocking stuffer on my. Um, Letterboard, because today is the official release of They Call Me Mom, um, 52 Encouraging Devotions for Every Moment, with Moment with Mom, capitalized. <laughs> Perfect so, title. Packed with resources, and I'll put a link in the chat. We've got 52 weeks of resources for you at theycallmemombook.com. That's it. <laughs> Yay! Yay! Well, we knew we had to at least start celebrating. We, a lot of times, uh, those of you that have been with us a while know we have an after party once we quit the recording, <laughs> and a lot of times we celebrate. But I wanted to be sure we started on the high note, and not that we're going to get into low notes. That sounded like ominous. <laughs> <That's how we laughs> <laughs> Didn't mean that and stuff today. But I'm going to start today. Hi, Mary. Welcome. Anyway, uh, what I'm going to do is start today, and we we're going to talk about painting with words and using metaphors. And I would tell you, I get kind of excited. I, I'm a geek when it comes to word stuff. I'm just just a geek. I don't know if Melissa and Bethany can identify with word nerds here or, or uh, crazy, crazy people on, on that way. But you know, we finish these drafts, we finish these babies, and then we think all the editing where we worry about the grammar and if something's flowing. But it's this is where the artistry occurs, you know, the 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 spit and shine, the creativity. Sometimes those have bubbled up naturally in the first draft, but often those still need buffed out and polished and stuff. And I like to say that's the sparkle, the shine, and the stickiness to our writing. On that so I and one of those is through the use of vibrant language and which is also called figurative language and we're mainly going to hone in uh, under that umbrella into metaphors today because that, that's one of my favorites on, on that way Aristotle once wrote and I really like this quote to be a master of metaphor is a sign of genius just a master of metaphor. Wouldn't you like that when all of us hit the bestsellers list of the New York Times and win the ultimate Ohio, no, ultimate serious writer award and get to go to New York City on that way that we're described, picture your name, Melissa Stroh, the master of metaphor. Isn't that a great way to kind of inspirational and, uh, uh, that it's you know just to inspire us in that way so to become let's become masters of metaphors without overdoing it we'll talk a little bit about some over caution on that way and i think one of the best ways to become a master of metaphor is to discover and devour lots of really well written metaphors and, and stuff and to pay attention we've talked before on writers chat about when we read a book we read it on two levels as writers we read it as a reader but then often, if the, especially if the writing has moved us, let's go back and read it as writers. And yeah. a, lot, a lot of times that's when you see that. You guys are both agreeing with that? that Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, it's like a mentor text in a way. Like when you find someone who's really great with that prose, thinking, what were they doing here? Like literary writers often will take a, a macro approach at something tiny. And when they're describing something tiny, they'll look at it from a from big angle so and trying then to copy that type of style that's it. exactly exactly so i want to share with you one reason what got me going this year to really look at metaphors is barbara brown taylor she is one of my favorite authors and i was in a study group that read this book learning to walk in the dark 
and stuff. And she just has you a whole other different perspective about darkness in your life. And she is a master of metaphors. You don't even know you're in the metaphor. <laughs> the whole book's a metaphor. You, know? yeah. you don't even know you're in it. And uh, But I, I've brought one of her lines that I just jumped out at me when I was looking for some samples was, but she was talking about her bones. She called the hollow flute of my bones. Ooh. Is it that? Is that, think of that image on that. But I wanna read you a passage from her book that I just thought was just, it, it's full of figurative language, both personification and, 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 uh, and we'll talk a little bit about figurative language here, but a little bit, listen to this and stuff. There are no dark emotions, just skillful ways of coping with emotions we cannot bear. The emotions themselves are conduits of pure energy that want something from us. They want to wake us up, to tell us something we need, to break the ice around our hearts, to move us to act. You see the personification and the metaphor within that, on that? And I'll jump down a little bit. Um, words, after a while, words laid down. Oh, she, she was trying to meet you, do a writing deadline. And I was thinking about Johnny last week, I know was on a writing deadline and stuff like that. And she would she just have been really, really working and every, she was getting everything done. Those of you that are a nano probably think this way, right? That now she was marching, she was making words march on the pages for 14 or 15 hours a day. After about two weeks of this, the words told me they could go on no longer. They laid down and died on the page like ants on a poison ant hill. <laughs> There's a simile for you, isn't that? Can't you see that? Mm -hmm. Their little black bodies were everywhere. Their legs curled up like burnt whiskers. I poked at them and they did not move. They were truly dead and I was nowhere near finished. So I pushed them around on the page, hoping that they might still be made to work. I rearranged their little bodies this way and that way, moving whole paragraphs of stiff words from one page to another. See how she communicated dead here too? And it was no use. There was no life left in them. But still, I could not stop because I was afraid if I would stop, I would fall into a hole I could not climb out of. What was in that hole? I don't know, but I didn't want to know because it was dark down there. And there was no light in me. And that's when I knew I was in trouble. I, I love this last sentence. That I felt like a grave digger who did nothing all day but dig up the bodies she had just buried so she could bury them again since there was only there was only one way I could think of to stay out of the hole myself. Ooh. Isn't that phenomenal? So I think if you take the right metaphor and put the right figurative language there, you can add a lot of depth and you connect. You know, I, I'm reading, I was right into that when she said moving around like dead ants on an anthill. Kid, as writers, can't you see that? Yes. It evokes so much. I mean, you instantly empathize. You've yeah. been there. You felt it. You felt it that way. And that the emotional side, visual storytelling, Leslie said, and I think that is, that is exactly what they do. So they're powerful weapons that we have in our writer's toolbox on that way. That's a metaphor itself, isn't it? <laughs> but anyway, I've, it's vivid. I, I think in a lot of times it could be very creative and imaginative and add life to our writing. So think about that. Here's another quote that I thought was good that Orson Scott Card said, metaphors have a way of holding truth in a small place. Mm, I like I think, that. And they, isn't that, I like that. And so there's truth is somewhat at a heart of a metaphor. It can't be dead. It can't be too odd that it won't fit in. We'll talk about that in a little bit. It, it can't be too flowery, but it's got to hold some truth to it on, on that way. And uh, 
that I just think it's figurative language is what we're talking about more than anything. So there's different kinds of figurative language. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that, but there's alliteration. And uh, uh, Rachel had said earlier, we had talked about that at one other time. At, at alliteration, a lot of poets do some great alliteration. Sometimes um, chapter titles uh, of our books are great places for alliteration, or just book titles are a great place for alliteration of that. There's hyperbole which would be uh, sort of those dead ants, sort of, though that's personification probably more than, uh, but the hyperbole would be, might be along um, some of the American folk tales. You might see some hyperbole in that. Um, or when we look at uh, really cold weather, cold weather hit the Midwest this week. You know, I, could, you know, I was just, I had all sorts of hyperboles going on in my <laughs> environment here on that way. And I think I saw uh, Bethany at a soccer game complaining in 60, 69 degree <laughs> weather of having her flip flops on. And I thought, yeah. I knew everyone from the North was going to like, be like, whatever. <laughs> whatever. What are flip flops? What are flip flops this time of year? It was cold. Yeah. <laughs> there are idioms, which is like common statements, you know, uh, good fences make good neighbors type Stuff, stuff like that. And sometimes those could also get into cliches, so you got to watch that a little bit more. There's onomatopoeia, onomatopoeia, I always have trouble saying that, which is like uh, the uh, animal sounds, the rhyming words, that, that sort of thing. And uh, personification, I mentioned, that's the ants, the, the words became ants of that. And I thought it was interesting. It was a good review for me to, to look up similes. What's the difference mm -hmm. between a simile and a metaphor? And simile actually uses the word like and as, where metaphors just become, it's comparing two things. Metaphors are actually, I thought it was interesting because, again, I'm a wor uh, word nerd. And in Greek, it goes back to mean it carries something. Oh, isn't that neat? Or it transfers something. And actually what it's doing, it transfers or connects a meaning between two unlike objects. Ants and words on our page. Ants and words. Two unlike project, uh, uh, things. And it combines them and puts them together on, on that way. Um, and it makes a comparison or some sort of links them somehow by finding the similarity on that. Here's a couple other ones for you. He had the heart of a lion. She has the energy of a, of a bunny. Or the canvas of life is colorful. And you kind of see all that, you know, on, on that way. You can't take them literally as true. You know, nobody has the heart of a lion, but it betrays something on, on that way. Can you guys think of any metaphors right off that come to mind? Um, well, on the Reedsy blog, they have like a list of like 95 metaphors from different like popular books. But when they were talking about similes, just like you said, um, they, you know, the like and as, they're saying, you know, life is like a highway. But if you say life is a highway, now you've made it a metaphor carrying motion, I think is what, how they described it. I thought, okay, that's interesting. If it is. Take out the words like and as and, and change it into that. I think it makes it more powerful. I think it's stronger. Yeah, and sometimes you struggle because so many metaphors have been used so much that then people tell you to stop using them. Like he had a jaw of granite. They don't like the use of that anymore, but how do you describe a powerful jaw? And that's the first one you come to. Well, I'll teach you a trick here in a minute, maybe you can, how you do that. So I could see in your first draft, you might've written that, but in the polishing draft, when you go through, you drop the word like or as, or you come up with another powerful image to put into it and then you play with it. See, I think this is the fun part of writing. I just Yeah, I do too. This is the, what makes it super good. Yeah, I think, it, I think it really does. And I think it's part of the writer that we can take the reader, connect a thought to the reader in an unexpected way. We all connected when Barbara Brown Taylor talked about the ants, dead ants on an anthill. You know, we just brought us right in. That was unexpected. You know, so you're, I think as a writer, you're giving your uh, readers a gift that they never thought was coming. And you both fiction and nonfiction, devotional writing, blog writing, it can be used in, it is a wonderful tool in our toolbox on that way, uh, on that. Here is a great example of unexpected and you're all gonna know, know it once you hear it because he was the master of metaphors, William Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. 
But soft, what light through yonder window breaks? It's the east, and Juliet is the sun. Yes. Isn't that it? Isn't that it? And, and stuff and, and that way. And then of Mice and Men, John Steinbeck. John Steinbeck, I love. But anyway, he said, well, you keep away from her. She's a rat trap, if I've ever seen one. So isn't that a good, there's, there's a good example for fiction writers. She's a rat trap. So anyways, put your glasses on and watch for it in literature as you're reading that. They're all over. And it makes um, scenes, I think it adds power, muscles. It adds, it, it becomes vivid on, yes. on that way. Um, here is uh, Dean Koontz example. And I think this is a really good example where he took an image, described what was going on in his character, but became a, a really, a, 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 you could identify with it once you hear it. And this is from the book, Seize the Night by Dean Koontz. Bobby Holloway says, my imagination is a 300 ring circus. Currently, I was in ring 299 with elephants dancing and clouds, clowns cartwheeling and tigers leaping through rings of fire. The time had come to step back, leave the main tent, go buy some popcorn and a Coke and cool down. Mm -hmm. isn't, that, isn't that interesting? I would have never have thought of it. And I loved it that he was a two ninety nine. dollars <laughs> yeah. On that day, it was just, that was unexpected. But it painted that image and you knew. And it was time to leave. Can't you see how you, Melissa, you could take one of your fictional characters and put them like that? Because you're in Ireland, so I'm not sure what they'll, they oh, won't no. have a three ring circus in Ireland. <laughs> That's so many metaphors. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you could do a lot. But it, I, I love this idea that metaphors entertain and tickle the brain, too, because you take two extremely unlike objects and um, put them together. Uh, love is a battlefield. So that's your song in your head now, huh? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that, that's a, that is a good one on, on that way. Here's a couple other examples that I think tickle our brain. The sun, S-U-N, by the way, S-U-N, was a toddler insisting refu to refuse to go to bed. And it was past 8.30, and it was still light out. And then that way. John Green? Uh, yes, it is John Green. How'd you know that? Yeah, I'm, I'm impressed with that. Um, and this is from the Fairy Queen's Deception, this one. Del Delia was an overbearing cake with condescending frosting, and frankly, I was on a diet. I love that. <laughs> Isn't that just wonderful on, on that way? But often metaphors also can take abstract concepts and kind of make them more tangible, mm -hmm. bring them to, uh, to grass, uh, grass and stuff. Um, if you look at the CEO, oh, here's Macbeth, by mm -hmm. the way, old William Shakespeare. If you can look into the seeds of time and say which grain will grow and which will not, speak then to me. <laughs> you know, if you're going to be wise enough, speak then to me. Good old Macbeth on, on that way. Um, on that, we, we got people starting to create some metaphors over in the chat room. We're going to come to that. We're going to do that. I think that's good on, on that way. Um, Virginia Woolf wrote, books are the mirrors of the soul. I so, like them too. But anyway, also listen to daily conversations because there are more conversations, things that we say, and some of them are overused cliches, but there are, you'll start hearing metaphors all over the place if you start looking for, for that and stuff. You've just given me something to chew on. He's just blowing off steam. Mm -hmm. she, he, she's a thorn in my side. And stuff. Can you guys think of any kind of everyday sayings or idioms that you burr might hear? Under my saddle. <laughs> oh, does say that again? What? A burr under my saddle. Burr. <laughs> I bet you do on the branch. No, yeah, you know that one. Oh, even like um, you know, you're an early bird or you're a night owl. Mm -hmm. Those are metaphors. Yeah, they're, they're all around. <laughs> 
And the, the thing would be is to, especially if you were to say, let's just use the early bird of the night owl. If we were describing a character or in a devotion, maybe a conflict between a husband and a wife or a mother and a child or whatever, you, you take that concept. You may have written that in the first draft. Then your challenge in your second draft is to come up with something a little different that's not mm -hmm. as common, but you got the basis. You got the foundation. Right. I can't talk without my hands, you guys. You know, talk to you. That's that. a good part of the rewrite too, is getting that out there and then taking all those simple scenes and, and saying, okay, it's dark outside, but how can I actually make that something better something and pull the straight into it? Yeah, okay. on that way. And I'll, I'll give you a couple ideas here in just a minute on what we could do about that. Okay. There are different types of metaphors. And there are the simple common metaphors, which is kind of a lot of what we've been saying on that it's just pretty they're easy to spot they're pretty short succinct uh he had the heart of a lion you know very much on on that way um and then there's a uh, implied metaphors i'll give you an example on on that that's not quite saying he's got the heart of a lion i'll give you the example that uh, the common metaphor would be she was a dog with a bone so it kind of compared your character with a dog or an applied metaphor was she tucked her tail between her legs and ran away. Mm -hmm. You're implying she's a dog, but without really saying even actually saying the word dog. Right. So that, that's pretty easy. But you, a lot of times those are metaphors too on that. Uh, imp, I have implied, uh, Pat Patricia asked, Im, I am implied is what, at least what my notes say. Then there's more extended metaphors. This is a no-brainer. This is kind of like the passage I read to you from Barbara Brown Taylor. It's a little bit longer, more involved, multiple sentences and stuff on, on that way. Um, an example is Maya Angelou's uh, I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings. Uh, but the bird will stalk down his narrow cage, can seldom see through his bars of rage. His wings are clipped and his feet are tied. The cage bird sings with a fearful twill, and his tune is heard on the distant hill, for the cage bird sings for freedom. So it's a little bit longer, more extended on that, on that way. Um, then there are dead metaphors, and these are the overused cliché once it's raining cats and dogs type thing and stuff. Um, it, the so uh, think of some dead ones. What what's what what which ones do you think you hear too much of? Beat a dead horse. You said dead, yeah. and then dead came to mind. Yeah. That's kind of like on the nose, but like, <laughs> 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 raining cats and dogs. Yep. What did you say that one though? Yep. But that's yep. But they're all around, and we you don't want to use those. We, I mean, you know, it, yeah. it's going to be too. It's going to jump up as cliches, on on that way. They've been around for so long and yeah. overused, basically, on that way. And then the the uh, next one is mixed metaphors. You got to watch some comparisons. Just plain don't work, but they could be a tool of humor. I'm going to give you a couple examples. Just think if you had a silly character in the in your book, Melissa, that got things mixed up, it would say something about the characteristic. And the one of the great examples, if, if you guys are, excuse me, if you guys are NCIS fans. Oh, yes. And the character of Ziva, mm -hmm. who, which is, who's back this year. Anyway, the character of Ziva, would, especially her first couple years on, would do mixed metaphors yes. all the time. Would use the wrong words, and Tony and Tim would just look at her like, so what? what? Uh, and, but it was her character. So yes. they can be humorous, but they can also tell something about the character. So I think you can use mixed metaphors in the right context and stuff. I thought this was uh, funny that... Um, Former British soccer manager Stuart Pierce said this, I can see the carrot at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in that way. Uh, here's two other silly ones. Um, it's raining turtles and hares. 
and let's tie up the red tape and get out of here. I, you know, those are just examples of probably ones that don't work real well, but, but again, think about it. It could be humor, could be humor that you could use it on that way. And then the, the last one, just as an example, is the sensory ones. Think about the senses on, on that way. His voice was silky smooth. Her smile lit up the room. That's a little overused probably, but think about your sense of sight and sound and taste and see if that can be incorporated in your use of metaphors. So I think it's, it's, it's sort of interesting stuff, but um, we mentioned keep an eye on literature. And like I said, you can't beat Shakespeare uh, on that. They are peppered. If you're a Shakespeare fan, they are peppered. All the world's the stage and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances and one man in his time plays many parts, his act being seven ages. And that's from As You Like It and stuff. But anyway, so you, if you really want a, a master, he would be the one on, on that way. A horse, a horse, my kingdom for a horse. All that glitters is not gold. On that and parting is such sweet sorrow there there's some just examples from good old shakespeare on, on that way even our bible has metaphors on on that way and uh it's <laughs> i should i should have more of an accent to say this shouldn't i patricia <laughs> i'm not real good at speaking shakespearean though <laughs> on that that we could uh do that we'll have to read so i'll gonna have to go back and read some of the comments in these it looks like the chat's doing really good and uh -huh. but anyway metaphors from the bible you guys all i'm going to test you guys to think of one but i am the good shepherd yeah it is an example i lay my life down for my sheep on that way can you guys think of any right off in the bible mm -hmm. the good shepherd was the one i was thinking of yeah um, you know the the lion lays down with the lamb Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I was thinking you, some from Song of Solomon, but now I'm afraid I'm getting things goofed up in my head. Is it, neck is the Tower of Lebanon. <laughs> yeah, there you uh, go. Tree of Life, maybe, could be. Yeah, I am, yeah. Uh, you are the father, we are the clay, you are the potter. Mm -hmm. Living so, water. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah, so there is a lot. So kind of, like you said, fine tune, start watching, you're gonna see metaphors all over the place. Even speeches, famous speeches. Uh, Hitler's finest hour speech had metaphors. He wrote, he said, Hit, oh, I'm sorry, Churchill's. Hmm, said the wrong one because I'm looking at <laughs> like, oh, Churchill. <laughs> Churchill's. <laughs> he starts with the word Hitler. That's what I was looking at. Hitler knows that he will have to break us into islands in, or, or he will lose the war. If we could stand up, to him, all Europe will be freed and the life for this world may move forward into a broad sunlit upland. See the, the idea of breaking this into islands? JFK, when he talked about going into the space program said, America has tossed its cap over the wall of space. Isn't that kind of neat? That's a neat image, I think. So there's some really good ones on that way. Even pop culture. You start listening to some songs. Oh yeah, they, they have got some new ones. I'm going to take an old one that I'll see if you guys can think of any current songs and stuff like this. There is nothing like the. Uh, I'm going to sing it. There is nothing but a hound dog looping <laughs> around my door. <laughs> you know, right there. You know, I thought that was a good example. But uh, can you think of any songs right off? Oh yeah. I actually had a Toby Mac song stuck in my head. The This world will leave some battle scars. And that oh. one really sticks in my mind. It's a good mm -hmm. one. Yep. Yep. So there are songs. So like, again, it's all, it's all over. So you can use metaphors to supercharge your writing quite a bit. And I would give you a couple examples of where you could use them on, on that way. And you can use them to, for like headlines in a blog post or uh, chapter titles. I was working on a book proposal this morning and I was working on my table of contacts, my chapters. And uh, some of them have got, some of them I think are gonna be, keep the names they've given us. Some of them, boy, I gotta work on the names of those chapter titles yet on, on that way. But, um, you, but you, could, you could do entire blog posts on it. You could do an entire book. Now, that I, when we, just before we went, started recording this, I was talking to Rachel 
And Rachel was, said she had won for her devotion um, the Ohio Christian Writers Conference. And she said that entire piece was a metaphor. So I invited Rachel, she wants to stick the link to that into the uh, chat room. She said she would if you guys want to read that. So congratulations, Rachel, for, for that. That is really, really cool. But she said the entire thing was a, was a metaphor. And you can, the entire books can be metaphors. Mm -hmm. Except think of Tolkien, C.S. Lewis, and, 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 um, yes, and some, um, or Dickens, Charles Dickens. Yeah, Charles Dickens, all yeah. that stuff. Yeah, you could really brainstorm on that. So I want to give you some idea how what you could do, and the, the, the uh, and one of the tricks that I have been working on, and I, I think this is a, a method that's going to help me, so I'll share it with you, is, is that remember if metaphors are basically two unrelated concepts, that I like the tool of mind mapping. So I take concept one, and I mind map, and if you know what mind mapping is, is you put the concept in the middle, and then you just kind of put branches. You could do it electronically or you do it on paper. I do it on paper all the time. And you put branches out like spokes on a wheel of all the ideas around that. Then see if you could come up with a second unrelated topic. Do the same with it, with all the branches. And then to see if those things on the outside, if they can correlate. Now, let me give you an example on that. On, on, on that. You could take say you're going to write a how-to article on something, mm -hmm. okay? So all your branches that go out, and I listed some down. You might write uh, uh, something on how-to. You might put voice, your style, what's your main message, your outline. You might do a draft first. You might, what would be a headline or theme, a deadline? Who's the audience? Oh, that's something to think about. Um, maybe the set of instructions, especially on a how-to, you would have a set of instructions. Mm -hmm. Maybe the number of words that you might have to have. Maybe what you want is the outcome. You want to write this article in order to do this, this, and this type thing. So then your unrelated topic might be cooking. So all the things with cooking would be recipes. You want it fresh. You want it mouth-watering. You, your end result would be the dish. You went, might use secret herbs or spices. You want it appetizing. What are the ingredients in cooking? What are the equipment you need? Who's going to eat it? Who's the chef? See how you play with those? And then you put them together. And out of that, you come up with ideas like the set of instructions or is like the recipe. The audience is the diners. Who's mm -hmm. going to eat this? And that the outcome is the end result on that. The style and voice could be the secret herbs and spices mm -hmm. on that way. The outline is the ingredients. And then you start putting those together. And out of that, you might come up with the, let's say you use the outline in your ingredients. You could create a metaphor. What are the ingredients of writing a great blog post? Let's mm -hmm. just put it that way. See? And it gives you a word, a picture word, right away from that way. I love the idea of mind mapping too, Bethany. And I think you're going to find if you do this, some unrelated topics don't work. You know, you're going to find out quickly, oh, that one doesn't work. But I think it'll often lead you to the next one, you know, on, on that yeah. way. So another use of metaphors is to bring to life boring statistics. You know, think think about that. I got a good example here. Is is uh, and you know sometimes we need to have some statistics and arguments and a research study, maybe in you know especially in the nonfiction to validate something. You know, but it's it's um it, I think it's important to kind of make it more visual. So if I told you the circum circumference of the Earth was twenty four thousand nine hundred and one miles. We get a little boring of that, you know, in that way. But if I said the circumference of the Earth was a hundred and eight hundred and one five hundred Olympic size swimming pools laid back to back, it really paints a different picture. See, so you could 
makes statistics come alive. You know, our brain processes visual so much more than facts on that on that that way. And I I mentioned audience a few minutes ago, and I think you always got to consider your audience too when you're creating metaphors. You know, because um, if you have a bunch of teenage girls, if that's your audience, you're gonna have a different metaphors and analogy than you would if you were addressing military spouses right uh, uh, i love that yeah oh, okay i didn't know if you were going to say something else there or, uh, on I that one like being a little bit crazy i i keep pausing but oh i was gonna say about the swimming pool um mm -hmm. when we in our platinum faith book we were trying to explain how much platinum there is in the world and if you put it in a swimming pool an olympic size one it would only come up to your ankles that's it. What? Yes. Really? Yeah. But gold, it could fill it multiple times, right? So like that was so interesting. Like that, it's that whole thing. It's creating that visual, you know, to create to make the point. That is genius. There you go, master. You you got that is a great <laughs> metaphor. That is a great metaphor. And stuff. And when you when you watch your um audience to think about your um language that you use you know i i catch myself still saying uh, to my husband says can you uh tape that show for me tonight well they're not taping things anymore you know <laughs> they record on d you know and i have to struggle to find that word and I, there was something on facebook a couple days ago about if you really want to fool the younger generation give them a rotary phone see if they know how to use it you know? Did you see that on Ellen? Was it on Ellen? No. What? Yeah. So she had. She was making this. It was like a competition contest with her guest, who was younger, and she had to dial a number out of the phone book. She had to look in the phone book, find the number, and then dial it. And she did not pick up the receiver first. She dialed oh. the whole thing and then picked up the receiver. And we, I mean, the whole audience was just dying. <laughs> but you know, I thought, you know, she doesn't know that. That's how you. For her, you push a button to connect. So for her, picking up the handle was to connect. But it was so oh, funny. It is funny. But isn't that a great example it is. for us to fine tune any of our writing? You know, but it, you know, is to think, uh, we always have to think about the audience. You know, that, that's it's a tip we always, always think about on, on that way. Um, I'm going to, I just about, done with this but i really want to take to have you think about um emotions the emotions you want to communicate and uh common problems i do want to mention common problems and we've mentioned one already of the, the overuse of certain certain ones to really try uh and uh, uh just to be aware of it they'll slip in and i think especially first copy they'll slip in mm -hmm. so you you've got to Cut your baby. What is it? Kill your kill your babies. Kill your darlings. Kill, darlings. <laughs> kill your darlings. Yeah, yeah. You gotta you gotta work on those and stuff. And I this was a term. I, it made sense once I defined it, but I didn't know what purple prose was. Did you know what purple prose? Ah, Melissa, what's purple prose? You know what that is? Overly flowery, flowerly. I can't even talk now. <laughs> <laughs> Over flowery speech. Over flowery right. speech. Yeah. And I, I think sometimes when we try to be that creative stuff, that that's the other overuse we got to watch. Mm -hmm. And that I, I knew about over flowery speech, but I didn't know it was called purple prose. Yeah. I that was that was interesting than that. And we mentioned misusing, misusing them because there's some fun, but there's a time and a place for misusing them and stuff on that. So what I'd like to do, we got a. a few minutes left yet but i like to we'll start with our two victims here on camera oh. and we'll invite other people to come on in it, it, so the those of you in the chat start thinking about this and stuff let's write a few metaphors come kind of let's be creative and write write some in that way and as writers mm -hmm. how would you describe let's say writer's block something like writer's block or how would you describe nano writer melissa since you're the nano, I always say that wrong. National, National Novel Writing Month. Yes. How would you How would you describe that, or what would be maybe an unlike object to tie that to? So, do either of you have an idea on that? Hmm. Well, 
I, I don't have a metaphor, but I guess it might be, when I think of writer's block, I think of being trapped in a non-padded room. <laughs> kind of like something isolated and stuck. You could probably do something with that one, couldn't you? Expand that a little bit? Yeah. Or writer's deadline, that might be something to think about too. Can you think of anything, what, what you're undergoing, trying to write each day, Melissa? What is it like? Um, it's like trying to grab a load of kittens and keep them in a box and they keep jumping <laughs> out. <laughs> I like that. I like that. I really do. It's uh, in, in honor of Johnny, a writer's deadline. What, when you're under deadline, what might be a metaphor when a writer's deadline is? I keep thinking pressure cooker, but I don't know. Yeah. Guillotine. <laughs> Guillotine. <laughs> that might be. That might be a guillotine. Derailed train came to mind. <laughs> <laughs> or a, a lumber train where the logs, logs all fall off. <laughs> yeah. There you, you go. Get them back on and make sure get they're back secure. On. I, I, we got to get to the train on the station on time. That's <laughs> like that uh leslie said getting through the fog to share the light Ooh, i like that one i like that one mm -hmm. and stuff well we've got you know about 15 minutes left and stuff but i thought maybe we'd invite everybody back on a little bit early and just have kind of a discussion maybe they got a favorite metaphor so why don't yeah. you guys come on back on if you got a favorite oh, metaphor oh. a favorite writer that uses metaphors well if you thought of something for writer's block or writer a deadline or what would be you know i think it's overused to say the marathon and the sprint type mm -hmm. of thing the writer but um th th that's that could be a start for somebody on on that way so um anybody want to jump in do you got a favorite writer or a favorite mayor uh a uh, metaphor or an idea for one of our phrases? You uh, got me thinking on Shakespeare and the one quote that always came up to my mind was, I would challenge you to a battle of wits, but I see you're unarmed. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> it, you see how it brings delight? It makes you laugh. Oh, he is, oh, he, he's, he's loaded. He's That's it, Mary or Rachel, Sophia, you guys got any that you can think of? I, I have two that make me laugh. I love um, Much Ado, and I love um, what ben how Benedict describes Beatrice, I think it is. Um, it's like, if her breath were as terminal as her, basically her speech, she would kill for miles around. He just compares her breath, her, her words as killing. And um, I love Douglas Adams, and I put my, one of my favorite quotes in there earlier. Um, the ships hung in the air, much as bricks don't. And that was, <laughs> that's a Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy one, so. Ooh, that is powerful. And can, can, isn't it inspirational? When you find that, you remember it, don't you? They become yes. very sticky. And um, I imagine you underlined that <laughs> when you read that. If you're an underliner, some people don't never underline their books. New quoter. And, and stuff. Mary or Rachel, do you want to share a little bit of your that you're award winning? Can you read us a line or two from that? Um, sure, I put it in the chat. Hang on, um, sorry, I'll bring it up. I have a ton kind of buried actually for an upcoming post, too. That, that's on writing. Um, let's see, I mean, this is the stuff I pulled. Um, the GPS direction destination remained the same in the cloudy as in the morning's fair weather. I just follow them. God's direction changed because of fog or stormy skies. Um, sometimes like my car sidelines, sometimes like, like my car sidelines us and we overblow a gasket and find ourselves stranded roadside in rescue and repair. Wow. Um, Is this the one you said you rode at the side of the road? Yes, I was literally stranded for four hours on the side of the road, and God started to be right before the car stopped um, about the GPS directions, because I'm fearful of big highways and things like that, and then the car just stopped, and that's what I did in those four hours. I started writing this devotional. I love that. 
That is great. It's <laughs> perfect. See? You are a writer. You are all a writer. Things, all things work to the good of those that love God, right? <laughs> <laughs> Even blown gaskets. Even blown gaskets. Wow. Wow. That's One of my favorites, though, is, um, and I just reread it in our daily reading, Bible readings, is um, The Valley of Dry Bones. I just think it's mm -hmm. one of the most beautiful and powerful metaphors for um, for life and for the, the body. Valley of dry bones. Valley of dry bones. Yep. Yep. That is. And it, it's one you could read and reread and study and get different meanings out of each time. And then yeah. maybe that's part of the power of metaphors is that they kind of uh, stay in our hearts and carry carry us through. And every time we think about it, we unfold it a little bit different or get, get, have a little more of a depth to it to it rachel did you have something else you were, you were going to share i can't remember what uh, i mean if you want the one from my poem the line from my poem that one at north carolina uh -huh. if my ipad would behave <laughs> that's all right it's okay um i put that in the thread too but um Uh, I am a riverbed that cannot contain the rushing water. He reigns in me. He reigns on me. I overflow. And that's speaking of, that's speaking of God, Jesus. Wow. Wow. So. Wow. We got a couple. I love that, Rachel. Thank you for sharing those. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We got a couple really neat things going on in the chat. So we'll put, I want to be sure it gets on the recordings. Leslie said metaphors. Well, went up oh god metaphors leave an image and a footprint on our hearts if done well but listen to that she's using metaphors to describe metaphors <laughs> i love it and christy said deadline it's the pull not the push one-way gate in a chain link fence with a bowl of kibble just on the other side i love that awesome. i love the word kibble instead of dog food even those <laughs> things changing no, it's not a metaphor, but it just take, it elevates, right? It elevates it. It elevates it and stuff. That 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 is just wonderful. And when she talked about the push pull, you know, think about how, how often I bet it's happened to all of us. We we go to a store and we push instead of pull the door, even though it's always right there, right there. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's me. It's a for king and country song, pushing on a pull door. <laughs> is it? <laughs> I love them mm -hmm. and stuff. And you, but we could use that as that is something that your audience would identify with and the chain link fence and the kibble audience would identify with and, and, and stuff at footprints, uh, and hearts. See, so you got, you got to use the right words on, on that way. Absolutely. Okay. Well, we're done a few minutes early. I don't know if anybody else wants to say anything else. We can get finish the recording up a little bit early and start our after party early. Oh, here we go. Patricia said, uh, the clouds weeped ice where you once stood tall. Ooh. Oh. I like that. That, oh, that just makes me, that does give me shivers on that. But that is just beautiful. Oh, that's beautiful mm -hmm. on that. There's Every one from when I was 16 years old. I'll have to go find that for you guys. <laughs> you just that just reminded me of something I wrote. Well, maybe it's time for it to bring it back out. Mm. Yeah. Some, sometimes these things that we write earlier, it's just not their time to be birthed. And it's just amazing how you resurrect an idea a couple years later or a quite a few years later on that. And I'll I'll just say this as a, as, as kind of a wrap up. And I don't know if I said this couple weeks ago or not do you guys realize in six weeks it's not just the end of the year it's the end of a decade <laughs> so think where you were in 2009 yeah. as a writer nowhere or yeah. what you may have written in 2009 that shouldn't have seen the light of day in 2009 but that could be tweaked that idea might might the time might be in 2020 to bring it out think of the technology changes yeah on that think how your family has changed how have you grown spiritually now i'm really off on something else but just think about that and and i think as writers we've we've got this treasure we could go back to 
our lives, our families' lives, our stories that we've written that just weren't right earlier, that right? And, and that way, on that. So, Brandy says 2020 is the end of the 10 year marker. I've seen it defined either way because I've, I've seen that controversy. And I've heard some people say, no, if you count 2000, you know, there's different ways to counting them if you count each year mm -hmm. on that. So, there's different ways of doing it. So, we can talk about decades next year then too, Brandy, on that in that way. Um, okay. Anything else? Uh, Bethany, you want to say anything else? Yeah, have you seen that? It's like a meme, but it's like, anytime someone says 10 years ago, it's still 1990 to me. Yeah. <laughs> That's still true for me. It That's is. still true. It is. But <laughs> Even I, as we go into 2020. I was pregnant and or nursing for all of the 90s. <laughs> oh, <really? laughs> All of them. <laughs> wow. Rachel says she didn't know she was a, even a writer 10 years ago. Think I wasn't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> think about it. I think it's a, it's, a, it's a wonderful kind of practice to do uh, mentally and spiritually and in that way, just like metaphors. I'll bring it back to our topic on that way. Uh, next week, so we get this on the recording, um, we are not meeting as the writers chat next week. We are taking Thanksgiving break and uh, letting everybody uh, have a week off to plan for family or whatever. It's, uh, most of us need a little extra time next week either to travel and think so. Happy Thanksgiving to everybody, as Tina said. Yes, yes, yes. Hey, and, Tina. And um, then the following week, which is December 3rd, Johnny will be back and in charge. And she's going to talk to just read book review people. You remember anything about that? Um, I can't remember who she has on on that. Yeah. Just read book reviews. And we're going to talk about, I think, about getting book reviews, right? She, there's a specific guest coming on, and I can't okay. remember. Off the I can't of either. But she's got a guest coming, and she, she'll interview, and we'll we'll talk. So we'll join, and so we'll meet a couple of times early December, and then we'll probably take a break over Christmas, like what we did last year too, and then start up again in January. <coughs> on that way. Anything else from anybody before we go off the air? Okay. Well, thank you for being with us today as we talked about metaphors, and uh, for those of you that are here, stay for the after party. Uh, that way and we'll see you in two weeks bye now